Uh, my name is Latanya Spencer. I'm the Community Involvement Coordinator for the Environmental Protection Agency for the Petroleum Products Corporation site. And we would like to welcome you to our proposed plan meeting on this evening. Um, as Josie just announced, please note that by participating in this recording, you are consenting to be recorded. We will use this recording for future reference. Please note that this uh, meeting is also being uh, transcribed, so we do have a transcription is present. On this evening, our agenda will consist of introductions. We will also have the video, the virtual presentation will run. Then we will also have a question and answer session. The question and answer session will first answer questions that are put in the chat room. If you have questions during the video presentation, please type it into the chat room. And also if it's a particular slide that needs to be addressed, please put the slide number in your question so that we'll know to go back to that particular slide. Josie will uh, read the question and have, and, and have us to go back to the slide that's needed to be summarized or explained. Also, at this point in time, if there's anyone that needs Spanish translation, please type um, your name and your need for Spanish in the chat room so that we can address you and so that you will have an opportunity to have the Spanish translation. After we finish with the question and answers that have put in the chat, we will open up the lines for additional questions. If everyone would please ensure that your phones are on mute so that we can um, cut down on back, background noise. And again, we will open up the lines when we go into question and answer after we answer the questions in the chat. Also, if you have a VPN, um, it will help if you turn it off so that you won't have any interrupt interruptions. So, as I mentioned, I'm Latanya Spencer. I'm your Community Involvement Coordinator with EPA. Also for this call, we have Remedial Project Manager, Michael Taylor. We also have Remedial Project Manager, Marsha Nail. Also from EPA, we have Kevin Kaporik and Bill Osteen, and as well as our EPA attorney, Rudy Tanashevic. From the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, we have Killian Talley. From the Army Corps of Engineers, we have Michael Grove. And also, now that I've done those introductions, if we end up having anyone from media, if you would please let us know in the chat that you're a part of the media. If you have any additional questions that we can address, we will. Also, if we have any congressionals or congressional aides, if you will put your information in the chat as well so that we can acknowledge you and address any questions that you may have. At this time, we're gonna run the virtual presentation. And again, after the virtual presentation is completed, we will answer the questions in the uh, chat and then open it up for additional questions. Welcome everyone. My name is Michael Taylor. I am a remedial project manager for the Environmental Protection Agency in Region 4. I am here today to provide details on EPA's proposed cleanup plan for the Petroleum Products Corporation Superfund site, which I will refer to as the PPC site. The PPC site is in Pembroke Park, Broward County, Florida. I will explain the history of the site, the Superfund process, and how you can comment on our proposed cleanup for this site. Here you will find the contact names and numbers for EPA and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection that are associated with the site. If you need further information after this presentation, we can be reached at the email and phone number provided. As I mentioned, the PPC site is located in Pembroke Park between Fort Lauderdale and Miami. The former facility is located a quarter of a mile west of I-95 off of Pembroke Road. The yellow line in this figure indicates the approximate boundary and the area impacted for this Superfund site. It is approximately seven acres in size. 
There are multiple warehouses and storage units currently on this property. Two former waste oil sludge pits that have been filled in exist underneath some of these structures. The contaminated soil and sludge has impacted the Biscayne Aquifer, which is a federally designated sole source aquifer. You have heard me mention the term Superfund. What is Superfund? This is a common name used in EPA for the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation and Liability Act, or CERCLA. This is a law that mandates cleanup of hazardous waste sites. EPA Superfund program oversees carrying out these, this responsibility. Superfund includes both removal and remedial actions. The PPC is under a remedial action. This slide shows the Superfund process. Once a site is discovered, the site is evaluated, which consists of a preliminary assessment and site investigation. The site is then scored for listing on the National Priority List. The PP site was listed on the NPL in 1987. The next step is to conduct a remedial investigation. We have concluded the remedial investigation feasibility study for the site. Currently, we are at the proposed plan stage. At the conclusion of the proposed plan, in comment period, we will make a remedy selection which will be documented in a record of decision. A design will follow the record of decision and then we begin imp implementation of the remedial action, which is the physical site activities of treating the soil and groundwater. Once the site actions are completed, the site will move into the maintenance phase. After all site remedial actions and goals are achieved, the site will be deleted from the NPL. Past operations at the facility utilized an acid clay refining process to treat millions of gallons of waste oil received from hundreds of locations. Two waste oil and sludge pits, which include the primary and secondary sludge pit, were used to dispose of spent waste material after treatments. The free product recovery refers to the free floating waste oil on top of the groundwater. Site documents and testimony show that more than 18 million gallons of waste oil was processed at the PPC facility during its operation. Here are two aerial photos of the site that show what the area looked like in 1963 and 1969. The 1963 aerial uh, shows the primary sludge pit location as outlined by the green box. Also pictured is one warehouse building and several above ground storage tanks. The blue outlined area indicates a water body such as a sinkhole or wetland. Uh, there were very few structures or businesses around the area in 1963, as you can see. The 1969 aerial also shows an expanded primary sludge pit outlined in the green. The secondary sludge pit is located to the north of the primary pit. On this slide, the blue lined areas are former sinkholes, wetlands, and ponds. The investigations uh, indicate that all these areas were eventually filled in and graded to allow for construction of storage warehouses that were built in the 1970s and 1980s. If multiple oil spills contributed to oily contaminants negatively impacting the soil and Biscayne Aquifer. These photos show some of the above ground storage tanks that were on the property during the facility operation and the conditions that existed there are obvious spills and releases that occurred as shown by these photographs. Uh, these are photos of Bay 261 at the Pembroke Park Warehouse. Inside this bay, the floor is purposely cut away in order to collect oil and sludge. Bay 261 is cleaned periodically from the lateral and vertical movement of oil. The viscosity of the material ranges from a light machine oil to a heavy crude, often a solid mass that is not readily pumpable. The oil and sludge pits are located underneath some of the warehouses that are located primarily on the south end of the warehouse property. These sludge pits extend to approximately 22, 24 feet below land surface. This is well into the groundwater and the Biscayne Aquifer, which begins at approximately five feet below surface. There is periodic daylighting of oil, which is above uh, ground the seepage of oil and sludge that seep through the cracks and around foundations of concrete and asphalt. The structures are more than 40 years old with noticeable settling and uneven foundations. The buildings 
are comprised of concrete foundations uh, and block walls. The initial remedial site investigation began in 1989. In 1990, an interim action rod for Operable Unit 1, which is product recovery, was signed. An oil collection system was established in the early 1990s that was later followed by the installation of a bioslurper unit in the late 1990s. A bioslurping unit is a vacuum enhanced oil collection system that collected light non aqueous phase liquids. The bioslurper unit operated until late 2012. During this period, approximately 43,000 gallons of waste oil was collected. Currently, product recovery continues with oil collected manually from existing wells and disposed off site. It has been estimated that 50,000 to 150,000 gallons of spent material may be impacting the groundwater. The site is located in the cone of influence, for example, groundwater drawdown footprint for the nearby Hallandale well field. The well field is approximately a half a mile east of the site and supplies water to Broward County residents. The oil and sludge has not impacted the well fields that supply the local drinking water. The buried sludge volume in this area is estimated to be around 50,000 cubic yards. The primary contaminants of concern identified on site are listed here on this slide. Additional constituents are present at lower concentrations that do not add to site risk. For example, we have polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs, heavy metals, PCBs, dioxins, and chlorinated compounds in the waste oil, sludges, and soil. The groundwater contains, for example, benzene, multiple chlorinated compounds, uh, PCBs, 1,4-dioxane, and multiple heavy metals such as lead and arsenic. This photo shows some examples of daylighting I mentioned. Uh, this is oil around the warehouse structures and roadways. There's occasional oil seepage at the parking lot and building foundations, as well as around one of our monitoring wells. As you can see, tire tracks where vehicles have driven through a, a seepage area and tracked it along the, the roadway. We have been addressing these seepages as they occur. These seeps are intermittent and do not daylight at the same location every time. Here's an example of the soil and sludge from two sample cores on site. The left photo shows subsurface conditions at different depths. The sample indicates very oily material from ground surface to five feet, and it continues from five feet to 10 feet and starts to get lighter at 10 to 15 feet, where it indicates a more native type of soil. The photo on the right is from another location that is heavily saturated with oil and sludge, but also contains very low pH levels from the sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid was used in this re-refining process. Our investigations show that sludge deposits reach depths of 24 feet below ground surface in some areas. This photo shows how the sludge is bound to the sand and silt below surface. The material will continually leach from the groundwater of the Biscayne Aquifer because contaminants are present beneath the site in the Biscayne Aquifer, there is a potential risk if contamination migrates through groundwater into nearby well fields. The contaminants pose a potential risk to local municipal well fields which draw water from the Biscayne Aquifer and service well over 50,000 residents. This photo shows the PPC site in relation to the nearby Hallandale well field which is approximately half a mile east and along I-95. The site is within the cone of influence and the two-foot drawdown of this well field system. There is another well field located directly north of the site, which is the Hollywood well field. The Hollywood well field is approximately two miles north. A third well field, Miramar, is more than two miles away and is located southwest of the site near the Broward and Miami-Dade County line. This slide will give you a conceptual site model of what exists at the site. As you can see, there are two distinct sludge pits which have been filled in and graded over with the construction of warehouses on top of the waste material. The contaminated soil and sludge continually impact their surroundings and the groundwater from migration of this waste. The PPC site is underlain by a series of carbonate and clastic sedimentary unit typical of marine deposits. The depth to the limestone varies across the site. Groundwater is often perched on the sludge. 
the surrounding area is highly developed with commercial and light industrial operations. There is also a significant residential area located to the south and west of, the, of this facility. Our remedial action objectives for this site are identified in this slide. Our objective is to minimize the migration of contaminants to protect the Biscayne Aquifer and the drinking water. We want to prevent leaching of contaminants from the subsurface soil and sludge pits to the groundwater. Our objective is to prevent any human exposure to contaminants in the groundwater. These objectives also include the prevention for migration of contaminants in the aquifer. In addition, our objectives include preventing human exposure to contaminants in the surface and subsurface soil on the former facility and the subsurface soil in the Bamboo Mobile Home Park. The basis for action to protect the groundwater comes from CERCLA and the Code of Federal Regulations. There are documented exceedances of the maximum contaminant levels or MCLs in the groundwater for contaminants such as lead, PCBs, volatile, semi-volatile compounds, and PAHs, as I mentioned earlier. The site is within the cone of influence for the nearby Hallandale well fill. The Biscayne Aquifer begins at around 5 feet below surface and is approximately 200 feet deep. Soil contamination and the former sludge pits are impacting this Biscayne Aquifer. EPA conducts baseline risk assessments as part of the remedial process. A Superfund Human Health Risk Assessment estimates the baseline risk. This is an estimate of the likelihood of health problems occurring if no cleanup action were taken at the site. To estimate the baseline risk at a Superfund site, EPA undertakes a four-step process. Step one is analyze the contamination. Step two is estimate exposure. Step three, assess the potential health dangers. And step four, characterize site risk. To address the different contaminated media, EPA broke out the various media into contaminated media zones, or CMZs. A CMZ1 is for the unsaturated zone, which is the more widespread shallow soil from surface to five feet below ground surface. This area includes approximately 110,000 cubic yards of soil. CMZ2 is comprised of the main source area, which is essentially the two buried covered sludge pits that extend from five to 24 feet below the ground surface. The volume of material in the CMZ-2 is approximately 50,000 cubic yards. CMZ-1 is outlined with a white dashed line on the slide, while CMZ-2, main source area sludge pits, is shown with the red dashed line. This slide shows the third contaminated media zone, which is the extended plume for groundwater contamination. The groundwater has detections for contaminants of concern to a depth of 40 feet below surface. After identifying the areas and media contaminated from the site investigation, EPA will select a treatment remedy for the contaminants. EPA evaluates the different treatment technologies based upon nine criteria. This includes a threshold criteria to determine if the remedy is protective of the public, health, and environment as well as making sure it is compliant with the applicable or relevant and appropriate requirements or ARARs. A balancing criteria follows with how effective is the remedy long term and short term. How will the remedy be implemented? What is the cost of the remedy? The last two criteria are modifying criteria, which is there state acceptance for the remedy and is there community acceptance. This 30 day comment period uh, will help provide the community an opportunity for evaluating the proposed remedy. The cleanup alternatives were considered for several areas on site. The Bamboo Mobile Home Park is an area south of the former process area that includes a small area of subsurface soil under one mobile home. The area that is impacted is from two to five feet below surface. The contamination is a result of the oily material migrating from the former process area. Cleanup alternatives considered for the contaminated media zone, CMZ1, unsaturated zone, which is the shallow soil, are shown in this slide. A no action to excavation, stabilization, solidification, and thermal treatments were considered. This alternative addresses the soil down to approximately five feet below land surface. 
Clean up alternatives considered for the CMZ2, which is the main source area, are shown in this slide. A no action to excavation, stabilization, solidification, and thermal treatments were also considered. The main source area is predominantly the buried sludge pits that extend approximately 22-24 feet below surface. The cleanup alternatives considered for CMZ3, the extended plume in the groundwater, are shown here. A no action, a recovery and treatment system, a carbon injection with permeable barriers to monitor natural attenuation, our alternatives were considered. Since there are multiple contaminants on this site, no one treatment technology will address all the site contaminants. That is why we must evaluate so many technologies that address all contaminants. For all the remedial alternatives considered, there were some common alternatives and areas that remained the same, such as for the one mobile home in the Bamboo Mobile Home Park. This action will involve a very short duration to remediate since there is minimal amount of soil to remove and backfill. It will involve temporary relocation of the occupants in order to move the trailer and access the soil underneath. The excavated soil will be shipped off site to a landfill. The soil will be replaced and the property restored. The second common alternative involves the demolition of five warehouse structures that are on top of the buried sludge pits. These buildings are shown in orange and located along Carolina Street and 31st Avenue. Prior to demolition and off-site disposal of the structure, the, the building occupants and contents in the rental storage buildings and small business areas will need to be moved and relocated. The needs and requirements for the renters and leasing companies in these warehouses will be addressed between EPA, the property owners, and the renters on an individual basis. Keep in mind that no on-site activity will take place until after the design is completed, which is about two years from the record of uh, decision approval. The third common alternative involves a shallow soil excavation from underneath six buildings. These are highlighted in yellow, and the plan is for these structures to remain in place. Now, this slide summarizes the preferred alternatives. One mobile home in the Bamboo Mobile Home Park is proposed to be moved and the soil underneath will be excavated down to five feet. Backfilling and grading will occur afterwards. The remaining work will be on property that is zoned commercial industrial. Uh, the remedy will include a permanent move or relocation for the impacted tenants in the five warehouses identified for demolition, which are pictured in orange. Demolition of the five structures is required since waste cannot be addressed or treated with the buildings in place. The top two feet of soil, which is pictured in the tan color, will be excavated followed by stabilization and solidification of the remaining subsurface soils. Under the buildings, which are pictured in yellow, five feet of soil will be excavated for off-site disposal and backfilled with a flowable cement-based material. The six yellow highlighted buildings will remain in place and will not be demolished. The final action will include an interim short-term multi-treatment groundwater system to prevent further degradation of the Biscayne Aquifer from the oily soil sludge contaminants. This interim step will help determine if the remedy has a positive impact on groundwater contamination. Here is a summary of the cost for the alternatives evaluated and recommended. This table includes the common elements, estimated building value, and estimated relocation cost. The projected total cost for the proposed plan is $57.1 million. Now that the proposed plan has been made available, there is a 30-day comment period. After the comment period, EPA will prepare a summary of responses to comments received from the public and place them in the record of decision. A record of decision explains the cleanup and it also targeted to be completed in mid-2021 and will be available online and at the Broward County Public Library. Afterwards, a remedial design will be prepared, which is typically completed in 18 to 24 months, and then the remedial action will begin. EPA will let the public know once the record of decision is signed and before the cleanup begins. Community participation is an important part of the Superfund process. It allows the public and EPA to communicate concerns and issues, as well as provide a process to facilitate the proposed plans and decisions that are made 
for the site that impacts the community. If you would like to submit a comment on the proposed plan, you can mail, send an email, or call us. Our contact information is on the next slide. This PPC proposed plan is published and you can send comments to us until February 12th. As part of the process in providing the public an opportunity to review documents and information, the administrative record, AR, has been established. The AR can be viewed at the Broward County Public Library and on EPA's website. There is also a significant amount of information on the EPA website for PPC. The admin record in the regional office of EPA in Atlanta is currently unavailable for the public to visit due to the COVID pandemic. I want to thank you for your time and allowing me to present the proposed plan to you. So at this time, we're going to open it up for um, questions. Um, did we get any questions, Josie, on the, in the chat? Hi, Tanya. There was one question in the chat. Uh, it was a two-part question. It was, when will you know which buildings are going and when will we find out for sure which plan you're going to use? Okay. I think that's for you, Michael. Yeah, okay. Yes, uh, can, I'll answer that. Um, once uh, we receive all the comments from the proposed plan, we'll uh, compile those and, and include those in the record of decision. And the record of decision uh, will be um, a final decision document. At that point, it will be decided, you know, of this proposed plan, as you've uh, just heard the presentation, or if it's been modified based upon the comments that we received from the public or the state of Florida, and it may be modified. So a record of decision will be the final decision document shows that what structures uh, will ultimately be uh, demolished. Uh, but just keep in mind all of the uh, evaluation of technologies and treatments do include the, uh, the five buildings that we identified and our approach was to minimize the number of buildings that would be affected. And, and this is the end result. These are the minimum amount of buildings that would be affected to accomplish the, uh, the goals that we have for this site. Thanks, Michael. We actually have another question that's been submitted. Um, the question is, won't the presence of PCBs exclude a Class D landfill for disposal? Also, how will the gun range in the building affect the project? Okay, on the PCB question, uh, PCBs are present. Uh, they, uh, they're very low levels. Uh, what we'll do is, is once soil is excavated, uh, sample analysis will be uh, performed on the batch look, uh, soil, and it'll be determined what disposal method will be offsite disposal at a subtitle C landfill or subtitle D landfill. And as far as, the, could you repeat the port part about the gun range? Sure. It said, also, how will the gun range in the building affect the project? Well, the, the gun range building is, if you see on the, the presentation, is actually the center of the site. It's, it's on top of the primary and portions of the secondary sludge pit. So of all the buildings, that one is the most centered located and it would have to be removed to get access to the soil and the sludge pits, which the majority of the depth of soil down to 24 feet is underneath the gun range building. All right, great, There are Michael. two aerial photos of the site that show what the area looked like in 1963 and 1969. Uh, great. Thank you for that response. Uh, I do have another question here. It says, do the groundwater impacts extend to the right of way? I'm not sure uh, the groundwater impact extends to the right of way. Uh, uh, could you explain what, what's your question? 
So let me see if the participant has more to add to that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, to, I'm not sure what, the, the, uh, to the Department of Transport right of way on Pembroke Road. It it extends to uh, Pembroke Road as we have identified to the north, and it if you recall the yellow outline of the property, and there's a red line that shows on one of the slides the uh, identified groundwater contamination. Mike, if you give me a moment, 40... I will I will pull that slide up. Just give me a moment. Okay. I don't recall what slide number it is, but it's it's near the end. All right, one moment. Folks could just bear with me. All right, I think this might be it. I'm trying to get the most complete picture here. All right. Michael, can you see my screen now? D is this the map you were thinking of? No, uh, it's uh, it's one with the um, investigation. It shows the ground. It's a heavy red line. It may be um, before this one. One moment. I apologize, folks, trying to navigate to this okay. slide. Thank you for your patience. Uh, the one you just uh, were showing, with CMZ one and two, I believe it's the next one below that. The next one, that's that's it. The red dash line. Thank you. you see folks. this? This is the CMZ three, which is the groundwater, and this red dash line shows what we have identified through our investigation of of uh, groundwater contamination and dissolve phase uh, as as deep as forty feet below surface, and it is within the yellow boundary and the Pembroke Park Road is to the north of that yellow line. But now keep in mind, after soil treatment and sludge treatment, uh, there will be additional groundwater uh, investigations or sampling necessary in the event that there's some migration of, of contaminants. Because once you start staring up the soil and, and the sludges, there may be release of contaminants and the groundwater could carry that. That's the reason for having an interim action uh, groundwater component to minimize further spread of contamination, especially to the well field to the east and to the north. So at this time, it extends almost to Pembroke Road as we've identified it, but additional investigation will be needed after the soil work. All right, great. Thank you, Michael. All right, great. I don't think we have any additional questions unless uh, that participant who just submitted a sort of follow-up comment would like me to read it out loud to everyone. Um, I think we're, yes, we're good to go then. Uh, if anyone has any other questions they would like me to read out loud, please submit them into the chat. Uh, otherwise, Tanya, let me know if you would like me to uh, allow folks to unmute themselves. Yes, please go ahead and uh, unmute the lines. And if anybody has any additional questions, we will um, open it right now for those people to um, ask their questions. Don't be shy. Does that tell me I explained things very well or get totally confused? We're still accepting questions via chat. If you don't feel comfortable with coming off of mute, uh, feel free to submit your question via chat. Or if you're having issues coming off of mute, I'm happy to help you. So we actually do have another question submitted via chat. It's what was the outcome of the air sparging system that was on site and is now demolished? That was a system that was in operation in the early 90s to mid 90s. Uh, that was replaced by the biosurfing system uh, later on in the late 90s. 
that system did collect uh, approximately 3,000 gallons um, or so of, of oil, L and apples, and it was replaced because of a, a much more efficient system. The bioslurper system was was uh, put in use after 1997. So the air uh, system that was removed, uh, the state of Florida removed that uh, two years ago, and that's no longer on the property. All their old equipment has been removed now. All right, thank you, Michael. Still waiting for additional questions in the chat. Uh, folks, if you would like to join, you can unmute yourselves or you can write a message into the chat and I will ask that question aloud over the line. Still no additional questions. Let's see here. It looks like someone's having an issue unmuting. Let me see if I can help them out. All right, let me see if they, can they do it now? Hi, <laughs> I, can, I can talk now. Hi, um, quick question on the, what type of water treatment system or what do you think on the water treatment end on, on this project will be uh, for the discharge criteria and kind of just overall treatment of it? And could you state your name, please? Josh with Envirocon. Okay, now the groundwater treatment, that's gonna be an interim action that we're proposing. Uh, what will happen is once the soil and sludge work is completed, there will be a, a, a short time period of approximately a year, to year and a half to assess the groundwater and see if what the conditions are. Uh, we hope they're, they're greatly reduced once we remove the source material or treat the source material. Uh, it will be a multi-train system since we have uh, different types of contaminants of concern, you know, with the metals and the chlorinated compounds and the PCBs, et cetera, that one treatment will not address it. So we will have a multi-treatment uh, train set up. And if in the proposed plan, it goes into more detail, but what it'll consist of is approximately uh, six uh, wells a a across the property within the yellow outlined area that you see. And it'll be um, a, a, a oil water separator system, a, um, a, a filtration system, a pH adjustment, uh, uh, an infiltration gallery once we've treated the, the groundwater to try to re-inject it uh, on the west side of the property. And that's the preferred method. If we're not able to install an infiltration system, then the alternative will be the, a POTW or the open uh, lake to the west for an NPDES permit. So there are some options for uh, post-treatment of groundwater, but first, we're going to determine if the actual need for groundwater is necessary after that roughly 18 month period of soil and, and sludge treatment. Okay, thank you. All right, this is Josie Torres here. I'm taking a look at the question queue in the chat and I don't have any other questions to add. Folks, remember you can uh, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask a question. Let me know if you're having issues. I'm muting your phone, happy to help you out. Also, please note that if you think of any questions after this is over, you can also email your um, comments or questions to Michael Taylor or Marsha Nail. Um, so the comment period doesn't end until February 12th. So if you don't think of anything today or this evening, please feel free to email it to Marsha or Mike. And everything that's being recorded today will be a part of the responsiveness summary that goes into the record of decision. 
So we'll give a few more minutes just in case anybody has any other questions. All right, we actually have another question in the chat. Uh, it's a question about the map specifically that we're looking at on the slide. It's the area of red lines. Those area are those areas just being monitored after the excavation. Uh, the, this person comments that their building is in the top left of that area. Mike, yeah, this. To, uh, okay. Yeah, I heard you. Um, what will be involved you know keep in mind once the soil and sludge is addressed a lot of the monitoring wells that we currently have in position those will be removed or destroyed because of um, the soil and the depth that, that we have to reach in some areas so there will be new wells that have to be installed in in some areas that have been affected now the upper left corner that you're referring to that would not in include soil um, excavation so there will still be some some wells there we would be monitoring the existing wells in addition to uh, installing new wells to get a a uh, baseline if you will on what the conditions are after the treatment of the soil and sludge is completed Now, Any other you know, every, also, I was just oh, going to add, uh, you know, I just want to add, you know, everyone just, just keep in mind that, you know, groundwater here, everyone in this area um, receives groundwater through uh, city sources or county. So there are no uh, wells that are being used that are pumping groundwater or consuming groundwater at, at this time. As we know it, we've, we've done surveys in the area. So no one, um, is pumping groundwater for, for any potable source or use. Everything is uh, city supplied. So that's um, that's the site in what we call a delineated area. So it would require permits from the state to install any type of wells. Um, so I just want to make sure that everybody's aware that no one is drinking the groundwater in this, this vicinity. Michael, we actually had another question in the chat. Um, so is it only buildings south of 9th street that are going to be removed nothing north of 9th street or 19th street excuse me uh so are only buildings south of 19th street presumed to be removed nothing north of 19th street could, josie could you go to the slide which shows the five orange uh colored buildings that will explain it'll be a good visual is it later in the presentation? It should, uh, it, it'll be lower down uh, in the slide deck. Yes. Let's see here. Right there, you go. It was it was back there in that last one. That I see it now. We can use okay. this the preferred remedy. At Nineteenth uh, Street, I believe it's it's small, but it's posted on on this slide. As you can see, all the buildings that we're looking at for proposed demolition are in orange and they they do fall south of 19th street um there are four on the pembroke park warehouse property and one on kelsey property at 31st avenue and carolina street at the far right corner those are the five buildings that uh, that fall uh, into the demolition category the yellow buildings uh, we, again, we're proposing those remain and uh, excavate underneath since they're much shallower contamination there. And if it's found, if it is found later, uh, even during the design phase, that there's more extensive contamination or or deeper contamination than what we're aware of, there will be an evaluation of whether to demolish one of those buildings or try to save it. Our our approach overall was try to save as many buildings as possible because uh, we don't want to demolish any more than we have to but uh, it actually um, came down to these five uh, based on where the contamination and the depth of contamination uh, to accomplish all of the goals that we have for this site that had to be removed to get to the contaminated soil
Great, thank you, Michael. So looking at the comments, uh, the chat rather, I don't see any additional chats. Folks, feel free to uh, enter your questions or your comments into that chat there. Or you have an option to unmute and ask Michael your question directly. Hey, Michael, this is Maria Salgado, FDOT. I have a question. Um, we have projects working along uh, DOT right away. And as per guidelines from uh, DEP, we're supposed to look for any super fund or any contaminated a site that shows up on the GIS layers that have a potential impact for our projects within either 500 foot, if they're just uh, contaminated sites that are petroleum related, or if they're super funds, you know, a little larger radius, we have a thousand and so on. Um, how soon will this, and I came a little late to the meeting, so I wasn't sure I thought you probably already discussed it. How soon is this activity going to take place so that we can keep it into our radar so that when we do our projects, we know uh, what's happening in, in our surrounding projects? Okay, good question. The, uh, the schedule for this um, project, uh, like uh, Latanya said, we'll be closing the comment period February the 12th, and we'll compile all the information from comments received, uh, prepare a record of decision, which we expect to have completed by June or July of this year. And after the record of decision is completed, there is an, a, a period that we have to uh, prepare consent decrees and, and uh, deal with the negotiations, uh, responsible parties, and the design would start after that, that's about 18 months. So by the time the rod is signed to actually starting physical activity, it could be two years. So if we finish summer of 21, so summer 23 would be what I would anticipate on-site activities to begin. That was very helpful. Thank you. Uh, so, will we? Sure. This schedule will be coming out is through this um, PowerPoint. Will you have the schedule that you're talking about, so that we can download and keep in our files for later? I think the best way to uh, keep up with the site information is through our web page. Uh, obviously, you can always call the numbers that we have listed there for the RPMs. Um, Marsha would be the, probably the best contact for scheduling, and if things change, you'll be able to provide that information or we'll have it posted as periodic updates on our webpage. And we do also list, you know, our, our uh, beginning of site activities in the local uh, newspapers and mail list that we have uh, on file. So we can share that information through several ways. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Maria, also this presentation is available on YouTube, so I can include a link to the presentation in the chat. That would be great. Thank you. Great. Any other questions from folks? If we don't have any additional questions, um, just a reminder, as Michael just said, the comment period started January 11th, it'll end February 12th. Um, so you have time to get your comments or questions in if you didn't get them in this evening. Um, and they will still be a part of the responsiveness summary that's a part of the record of decision, which will be the final decision document. I wanna thank everybody for your time for attending this evening. And we appreciate you and we hope to hear from the community and the public with any concerns or suggestions or questions that you may have. So um, thank you for attending this proposed plan a Zoom meeting for the Petroleum Products Corporation site. And Josie has put the link um, down at the bottom for the access to the presentation. And if you receive the fact sheets, 
um, you have the email address for the EPA website. We also have all the documents downloaded that relate to the decision for this particular site and the administrative record on the site. We also have um, documents in French and Spanish, just in case someone needs them. So um, if there's anything else you need, please feel free to contact me, Latanya Spencer, Marsha Nell, or Michael Taylor, or Rudy Tanashevitz. All right, thank you everybody for attending. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you.